Okay. So I'm going to have to share my screen, right? Yeah, let me just um, do the introduction. Yeah, and yeah, then, yeah. Um, yeah. And then, yeah, exactly. And then cool. um, I will uh, hand over to you and you can share your screen. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. I'm just going to try and do that with presenter view. So it's, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. we'll see, we'll see. Okay, so I would like to welcome everyone. Um, thank you for Zooming in. Um, if you have just joined us, Please make sure to briefly introduce yourself in the chat on the right side, just saying who you are, where you're zooming in from, and what brings you here today. We are delighted um, to have Dr. Cassia Banas today. Um, she's a lecturer in behavioral sciences and healthcare uh, within the School of Medicine, Dentistry, and Nursing at the University of Glasgow. Um, she is a social psychologist by training and has been keen, um, has a keen interest in how social factors influence behavior, including studying and learning. Before coming to Glasgow, Cassia spent four years working in a teaching focus role at the University of Edinburgh, where she studied um, the extent to which first year students identify with their study discipline or university and whether this has consequences for their education outcomes or well-being. Now in collaboration with Dr. Eva Mersin, who's also um, present today, so welcome Eva, from the University of Edinburgh. Cassia is working on a longitudinal project exploring the use of lecture recordings among first-year psychology students. Um, a very warm welcome, um, Cassia. I'm very excited to have you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and um, you're welcome to share your presentation. Okay, let me try that. Mm. Okay, and then... Okay. Right, so just to double check, Carolina, what can you see? Can so you right, see? Now, right now I see the presenter view and right. not- Right, so yeah. that's not what we want. Uh, okay. So what you can do um, mm -hmm. before you share your screen, so unshare it for now um, for a second. Yeah. What you can do if you go on, um, share screen. It, um, so first of all, um, start your presentation, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Start it first. Yeah. Um, so that you have it basically as, as your actual presentation. And then um, when you go to share screen, it gives you different windows um, to share and you select the one that basically is your presentation screen. Okay, let me try that. Mm -hmm. Oh, I think this is what I need. Um, yep. Yeah, that, that worked? Good. Yes. Okay, wonderful. Perfect. Um, okay, right. Well, good afternoon, uh, everyone. And thanks very much for joining us on this um, Tile Network talk delivered via Zoom. Uh, thank you, Carolina, for, for the really nice introduction. And I'm also delighted to, to be here and to be joining in from temporarily sunny Edinburgh. We'll see how long that lasts. Uh, so as, as Carolina already outlined, um, today I'll be talking about the results of an ongoing project. So these are very much preliminary results and, and we hope to have more as we go on. Um, and what the study is about is really how first year psychology student study. So we are looking at lecture recording, but we are looking at that in the wider context of different study practices that our students might be engaging in. Um, I wanted to start off um, by acknowledging uh, my colleagues. So we've got um, Dr. Eva Mujan, who is the co-investigator on this project um, and who is with us today on Zoom. Um, we also have Dr. Anita Tobar, who's been our research assistant for the past few months, and she's been uh, really great at doing a lot of the data cleaning and data analysis with us. And I also wanted to acknowledge our funder, 
And this project has been funded by an internal scheme at the University of Edinburgh called the Principles Teaching Award Scheme. Uh, and it's been administered by the Institute for Academic Development. So thank you um, to them for providing the funding uh, for this project. So I wanted to start off by defining lecture recording just so we are all on the same page. Um, and at the University of Edinburgh, uh, we use the name lecture recording as opposed to lecture capture. And I think that's an intentional naming convention just to um, express the fact that it is a recording, but it doesn't necessarily capture every aspect of a lecture. So it wouldn't, for example, capture some of the social interaction that might be going on in a lecture, or it might not capture um, the feeling of cohesion or identity that might be developing while students are sitting together in a lecture hall. Uh, what we mean by lecture recording is recording lectures while they are being delivered in the classroom. So this is not so much um, about recording lecture in advance and then giving that to students to watch in their own time, but it is really about delivering a lecture in the classroom and then students having the option to watch that lecture um, in the form of a recording. At the University of Edinburgh and also beyond, um, lecture recording seems to be enthusiastically welcomed by students. Students emphasize that this is something that they very much want and enjoy and that it makes learning easier for them, that it makes it um, more uh, efficient and that they are able to look things up afterwards and that they don't have to stress out about making notes as fast. So students are really very much in favor of this. Um, and because of that student enthusiasm, I think, uh, lecture recordings are being increasingly used uh, by universities, both in the UK, but also beyond. Um, and the universities will often have official policies in place about this which are often opt out. So the default option is for lecturers to record their lectures. And then if they don't want to do that, they can opt out, but they actually have to act in order to do that. Uh, when we ask lecturers, at least when we ask them um, at the University of Edinburgh, there was a certain degree of skepticism around lecture recording. And the reasons for skepticism were manifold. So some lecturers were worried about the drop in attendance some lecturers were worried about students not using the recordings in the correct way, so perhaps binge watching or watching a lot of recordings in a close succession. And some, students, some lecturers were also worried about maybe not being needed once all lectures are recorded and can be accessed online. What is the role of a lecture there? And of course, many of these concerns are valid and, um, and very much something that we need to talk about when we think about um, extending lecture recordings um, to different courses or universities. Uh, just to give you a very quick idea of where I stand in this debate, I'm very much a lecture recording agnostic, so I don't have a very strong view one way or another. I think lecture recordings are probably here to stay. A lot of people are using them. Uh, I'm sure a lot of students are using them well and finding them really useful. Um, so I think what we need to be doing it's not really asking the question, should we or should we not be recording lectures? But I think the question that we should be asking, or at least the question that I want to ask, is how do we help students to use lecture recordings effectively? And this is really what this project is about. Um, so just to give you a, a little bit of background of the existing literature, because of one of the concerns being attendance, there seems to be quite a lot of literature looking at the link between lecture recording and attendance. Um, and so far, uh, the outcome here seems to be that there is no robust link between lecture recording use and attendance. So we've got studies showing effects in one direction and we've got studies showing effects in the other direction. But overall, um, there does not seem to be a stable effect between have between providing lecture recordings or between students using lecture recordings and their attendance. Um, there is also another area of literature which I think is where our study is falling and this is the um, views around lecture recordings as um, an element of a wider study practice. So there is an increasing um, body of literature looking at how students use lecture recordings and how students use them within their wider study practice. 
And in particular, uh, we've been quite inspired by the study by O'Brien and Verma, which was published in Higher Education in 2019 and was really important for the development of this project. Um, and this is a study conducted among uh, students of the Bachelor of Commerce at the Sydney Business School. And it has a, a really quite large sample size. So it's a sample size of over a thousand um, students, uh, first year students at, um, at that course. And what Brian, what O'Brien and Verma did is they gathered a lot of administrative data. So they have administrative data on whether or not students access lecture recordings, um, whether or not students attended live lectures, and they also have data on whether or not students access lecture notes, which were made available online uh, for individual download. And based on just these three data points, so looking at the use of recordings, attendance, and accessing lecture notes, um, Brian and Verma were able to find four distinct clusters of students. Um, so here you've got the clusters listed uh, on the slide. Um, the first cluster they refer to as traditional, and these are the students who attend lectures and download lecture notes, but who don't really watch the recordings. Then we've got the digital cluster, and these are the students who download lecture notes and look at recordings, but they don't really attend. Then we've got the minimal cluster, and that's the students who don't really attend and don't really watch, but they do download lecture notes. And finally, we've got the so-called phantom cluster, and these are the students who have low attendance, low recording views, and also don't really download lecture notes. Um, so in this study, we had four distinct group of students um, who varied in their patterns of use of the different lecture resources. And I just have a table uh, copied in from the paper, which shows some of the differences between the students in the four clusters. So um, I don't really want to go into this in a lot of detail, but if you look at the second row in this table, so the table, uh, the, the row marked mark, you can see that there are some differences in how the students in these different clusters performed. And in particular, the absentee or the phantom cluster students um, received lower marks than students in the other clusters. And the traditional and the digital clusters uh, were associated with higher marks in the course. So there seems to be some kind of relationship between which cluster the students belongs to and how well they did um, overall in the course. So I wanted to spend a few words just introducing you to lecture recording at the University of Edinburgh, just to give you a bit of the general context. Um, so the University of Edinburgh, as far as I know, was quite an early implementator of lecture recording. And especially in psychology, where I used to work, uh, we were one of the first to jump on the lecture recording bandwagon um, and to say how we could uh, make lecture recordings available to students and also um, whether or not students would actually want to use them. Uh, we used Panopto as far, at first, but then the university switched to Echo 360, and this is what we used for this project. So we've been able to use some Echo 360 data. Um, the University of Edinburgh currently has an opt-out policy, um, so the consent for lecture recording is the default. However, lecturers are able to opt out if this is what they choose to do. Um, everything happens automatically as far as lecture recordings are concerned. So what that means is that if you are a lecturer on a course, you show up to your room and provided that everything has been set up properly, the recordings will just start at the time that your lecture is supposed to start and it will end at the time when your lecture is supposed to end. And it will then automatically be uploaded to the server and it will appear as a link on the virtual learning environment for the students to use. So lecturers don't really have to do anything in order to make the recordings available. They just appear on, on the VLE for the students. However, if you choose, you can of course edit the video or you can um, shorten it or whatever it is. But most lecturers don't do that. They just kind of let the system work. We've got quite a wide range of attitudes among lecturers um, at the university. And this has become clear during a series of events that the University of Edinburgh had for student entry stuff. So I think it would be fair to say that there are quite a few lecturers who are really enthusiastic about recordings and who really believe 
that lecture recordings are useful and beneficial and that they should be used. Um, however, there is also quite a large uh, cohort of skeptics who think that there is indeed a link uh, with attendance and that students who know that lectures are being recorded don't pay as much attention and that the retention of information suffers as a result of that. When it comes to the advice for students, um, when lecture recordings was first, was first introduced, there was almost no advice for students whatsoever. The recordings were just made available, but there wasn't really much advice to accompany that. Uh, however, this is um, being changed as we speak. Um, so already in the summer 2019, some advice for students was being printed and also prepared in electronic form. Uh, and actually the advice that the University of Edinburgh used uh, was based very much on the lecture capture recommendations prepared by Dr. Emily Norman at the University of Glasgow. Um, and uh, Emily has prefer prepared an infographic uh, for students to use, advising them how best to use lecture recordings. And that infographic has been used in a leaflet that the University of Edinburgh printed uh, for students. So in our research project, we wanted to explore what students were doing with lecture recordings and was that useful. Um, so we wanted to look at how students use the recordings, but also how they use other resources that we make available for them. Um, so we wanted to look at attendance and we also wanted to look at their reading behavior, for example. Are they reading the textbook? Are they reading the articles that we assign for each class? Um, we also wanted to look at the attitudes towards lecture recordings. So my impression after a literature review was that a lot of studies were focused on attendance and on performance, but actually not that many asked students some um, more detailed questions around their attitudes. And, and the ultimate aim of the study is to build an intervention. Uh, so what we want to do once we have gathered the baseline data um, and analyze the data is we want to develop an intervention where we would guide students to the full cycle uh, around one single psychology lecture. So we would guide students on how to do their pre-lecture reading effectively and why it is important to do that. And then we would guide them through attending a lecture and taking notes during a lecture. And also we would uh, guide them through the process of revision, including the effective use of lecture recordings. So this is the intervention that we have in mind and the data that I'll be presenting today um, very much form the baseline assessment for the evaluation of this intervention. So now at baseline, what we have gathered are a, a bunch of different kinds of data. Uh, first of all, we've got the administrative data on lecture recording use, and these data are provided uh, by our virtual learning environment, LEARN, um, and they come from our lecture recording software, which is ECHO 360. And the data granularity is not, um, not particularly detailed at the moment. Um, so what we have for every lecture is the number uh, of views, or more importantly, the number of times that that particular recording was accessed by each student. And we also have the percentage of the recording of each recording that has been viewed. So if a student logged in and viewed half of the recording, we would know that they have watched 50%. So these are the two statistics that we have on the recording use. Then we've got administrative data about the downloading of lecture slides. We have gathered that data for every um, set of slides that was posted. And then we've got lecture attendance data gathered via Top Hat. So at the University of Edinburgh, we don't have a very uh, good system for routine checking of attendance at lectures. But for the pur purposes of this project, uh, we were able to ask lecturers to gather attendance in every lecture using um, the Top Hat um, lecture response system. So Top Hat is uh, it's a system that allows lecturers to ask questions during a lecture and then for students to respond interactively. But it also has the option to simply ask students, are you here at this lecture? And then students get a code that they can type in and by doing so, uh, they can confirm that they are indeed in the lecture theater. 
the other type of data that we gathered outside of administrative data were questionnaire data. So in, at the beginning of the semester in September, uh, we put uh, a questionnaire together asking students about a number of things around their um, study behaviors, but also about their attitudes towards lecture recording. Um, and we had both open and closed questions. And I will tell you a little bit about some of the findings in the later part of this talk. And then the final part uh, of the study are focus groups where we planned to explore students' attitudes in a lot more depth. And these focus groups were supposed to happen next week. Um, and at the moment, we are unsure whether they will actually go ahead because, of course, everything is, is somewhat up in the air uh, with, with the pandemic. Um, but we will, we will see. If we are able to do this, we will. If not, we will postpone it until it is safe to gather the students together and to conduct a focus group. So as I told you already, the, the aim of this research project is to build an intervention and what we want to do is to build an intervention that is informed by our baseline results. So what we are doing at the moment is we are really exploring the data, exploring the attitudes, exploring the use of lecture recordings. And we hope for those data to inform the intervention that we will build. And the aim is for this intervention to be delivered in September 2020. Again, we are not entirely sure what's going to happen over the summer and whether the students will indeed be back at university in September 2020. But for now, we are assuming that this will be the case and we will create the intervention as if this will be the case. And what we want to do is for this intervention to focus on one of the early lectures. So as I already said, the intervention will guide the students through the preparation process and the attendance and the revision of one particular lecture and we've already spoken about one of the lectures who um, would be happy to for the intervention to be built around one of her lectures which takes place in the second or the third week of the semester. The intervention would be delivered online as a compulsory activity for the students um, the students have to do a number of so-called study skills activities throughout the semester um, and currently they have one activity on note taking. So we think that perhaps we would be able to substitute the note taking activity with another activity that would be around um, the use of lecture recording as well as the reading and the, the making full use of one lecture. And what we'd like to do is then evaluate that intervention using similar methods to our current baseline study. So because we will have gathered baseline data, we will be able to see which variables have changed or which attitudes have changed after the introduction of um, the intervention. So that's the, um, that's the idea for the project and that's the kind of timeline that we are working towards. So just a little bit more context for you. So the, the course within which we um, conducted the study was a first year psychology course. We've got two courses in the first year, um, Psychology 1A delivered in the first semester and Psychology 1B delivered in the second semester. Um, this uh, study was conducted as part of Psychology 1A, so the semester between September and December. Um, the course had 327 students enrolled, about 90% of them female and about 40% of them actually pursuing a psychology degree. The remaining students were either taking psychology as an outside course or they were um, on exchange coming in from another country to study in Edinburgh for a semester or for a year. Psychology 1A has three lectures per week um, and they are all recorded by default and then available to students on the virtual learning environment. Um, and here indeed all lectures were recorded so we didn't have any any technical glitches every lecture that took place was recorded. Um, each week the students also have either a tutorial or a, or a lab and this is a more hands-on session where they either discuss uh, research, uh, recent research findings or they do practical exercises to do with research um, and students also get their lecture slides uploaded in advance and this is a requirement that the university has that um, all lecture slides have to be uploaded at least 24 hours before the lecture. Um, however, the practices differ here. So some lectures, for example, post 
the lectures, slides for an entire block of lectures, maybe for a week or for two weeks um, at the same time on the same day, whereas other people do it more gradually and they will upload the lecture slides just before every lecture. Um, so because of the different practices here, we weren't really able to look at the downloading of lecture recordings in as much detail as we wanted to. Uh, because the slides were, were being made available at different times and we couldn't really um, control when students had access and when they were able to download. I can see something on the chat. I'm not sure if that means questions. No, that's fine. This was that's just fine. me. Okay, perfect. Yeah, that's okay. Great. I will, I will ignore that from now on. If there are questions, then Carolina, please tell me. Exactly, I will let you know. Okay, no amazing. That's what we'll do. Great. Yeah, uh, I just thought this was a, a good time to take uh, to take a pause. Okay, so what I will tell you about Sorry, today, unless, unless you want to take a pause and take some questions at this point, that's fine too. I mean, I'm happy to if there are questions, and yeah. I will have a sip of water as well. <laughs> so, if there are any questions, feel free to put them in the chat or. Um, you just let us know and um, unmute and just uh, say the question. We give it a couple of seconds. Let's see. If there are some some questions from the audience at this point. I feel in Zoom there should be like this additional function where you have a uh, uh, music that you can just start playing when there's silence. <laughs> mm. Okay, there was one po Vicky um, said no so questions. So Vicky Dale, no question so far, interested to know about the methodology. All right. All right. Okay, let's continue then. Okay, I shall do. Right, so we can move on to uh, just an outline. So as, as I mentioned, this is an ongoing study and we are very much in the process of analyzing the data. Uh, so I will show you just snippets of the things that we found that I think are particularly interesting. Um, and this will kind of fall under three um, broad categories. So um, first I will talk a little bit about attendance because this is what the literature seems to be looking at um, and also we were interested ourselves in whether or not there were any links between recordings use and attendance. Um, then because I'm a social psychologist, I wanted to tell you a little bit about attitudes and norms. Um, we asked about those in our questionnaire study and I'm able to comment a little bit on what we found. Um, and then because we were so inspired by the study by O'Brien and Verma, we also did some clustering on our data and of course, we didn't have such a huge sample size, so I think it comes with, uh, with a pinch of salt. Um, but we did try, and, and I'll show you very briefly what, what clusters we seem to be getting in our study. Um, so just as a way of introduction, I've already told you that we didn't have a um, routine system for checking attendance at lectures. So what we did instead was we used Top Hat and we simply asked students to confirm if they were present in the lecture theater. This comes with, with some issues because of course, we weren't able to check if the students actually did that. So there were definitely some students who were present but who didn't say so on Top Hat. Uh, there may also have been some students who were not in the lecture theater but who were given the code and were able to say that they were in the lecture theater. So we don't entirely know how reliable these data are, but this is the best we could do under the circumstances. So um, um, please forgive us for not, not having any better data. We do know that not all students signed up to Top Hat. So when we looked at the data, we found out that only 303 out of the 327 students actually had an account. So there were uh, 24 students who didn't set up Top Hat on their devices. And because of that, they weren't able to say whether or not they were present at the lectures. Um, we didn't actually gather attendance data at every single lecture. Um, and that was in part because of technical issues, in part because of uh, some lectures not being comfortable with the system. Uh, but we do have attendance data for 24 out of the 30 lectures that we had uh, during the year. So um, we do have data for the majority of lectures. Um, 
Attendance at lectures in this course had no consequences for the mark. Um, so students were free to attend or not. Um, it, it didn't have any consequence. However, according to the course handbook, lectures were mandatory. So students were certainly very strongly encouraged to attend lectures, even though it didn't count towards their mark in any way. Um, so what I'm gonna show you now is a graph of um, the proportion of students who attended at every lecture during the semester. So you can see on the x-axis the dates of the lectures. And as I said, we don't have data for every lecture, so some dates are missing. Um, but every bar will correspond to a lecture date for which we do have data. And as you can see, the tallest bars are just a, around 75%. Um, so at the best attendance lectures, we had about 75% of students attending. And then at the poorest attended lectures, we had about 20%. And um, those two very short bars, um, I did look up in the handbook what was happening during those lectures on, or on those days and whether there may have been a particular reason why these lectures were so poorly attended. I couldn't find any reason, um, but it might also be that there was a technical glitch. So I'm not, I'm not entirely sure if we can trust um, these data very much, but there seem to be those two lectures on the 1st of November and on the, 5th, on the 15th of November that were really quite poorly attended. Um, and then we've got pretty good attendance in the first half of the semester and it seems to be dropping off in the second half. So on to our recording data. Um, we have, as I mentioned, the ECHO 360 interface available on LEARN, um, but it is not very detailed. So as I said, all we've got is whether or not the students access the particular recording and how many percent of that recording they've watched. Uh, we have asked ECHO 360 for more granular data and we are um, awaiting their response on that. So we are hopeful that we will get a data set that will actually give us more information, for example, around when students watch particular recordings. So we know from our previous work that um, students seem to be watching recordings a lot in the revision period just before the exam, um, but they don't seem to have a very sustained revision practice. But with the data we currently have, uh, we just can't know this because we don't have the date of access. We only know whether or not they access and how much they access. Um, we do know that a significant minority of students actually never access the recordings interface. Um, so about 40 students in this cohort never looked into ECHO 360 um, and never set up an account within the Psychology 1A course. Um, and the patterns of usage of lecture recordings vary quite widely. So we do have students who don't seem to be watching recordings at all. And we had students who seem to be accessing almost every recording and watching it almost in full. So we have a, a wide variety there. But what I wanted to show you is just um, a graph with the attendance data that you've already seen. So the bar chart. Um, but also the recording um, access data in the red line that you can see. So this line will tell you the proportion of students who accessed the recording on each date. And as you can see, there is a little bit of fluctuation, probably between 20% and 40% for every given date. Um, but the mean seems to be around 30%. So around 30% of students on average access any given lecture recordings, um, any given lecture recording. So the recording access, if, if you remember the graph from, from the previous slide, it seems to be quite stable. Um, so regardless of whether or not the lecture was attended um, by, by a high or a low proportion of students, um, the use of recordings seems to be actually quite similar. Um, and again, I looked up what those lectures were about and what was happening on those particular dates. And there seemed to be no discernible pattern as to which lectures were uh, accessed more by students and which lectures were accessed less. Um, so to me, it seems um, relatively unrelated to the lecture content or to the time in the course. Um, but as we dig into the data more, we might find uh, some more relationships there. Uh, I can keep you posted on that. 
So the next questions we the next question we asked ourselves was Cassia, around yeah. Cassia, I have one question from okay. um, an attendee. So um, he asks, um, does the access rate consider how long they access access it for? Is watching it all the same as watching for five minutes and then stopping? Right. So we have two data points per lecture. So we have how many times this lecture was accessed and how much of the lecture has been watched. So we would know whether someone watched the whole thing or whether they just watched five minutes. But what we don't necessarily know is how, if they access more than once, how much they watched within each time. So if someone accessed twice and watched the whole lecture, we don't know if they accessed twice and watched half in each watching, or if, for example, in one watching they watch 10% and in the second watching they watch 90%. Um, so the, this, is, this is the data that we have. Okay, uh, and I think another thing, um, not so if, you, if you're checking, if you look mm -hmm. at the chat, um, we may have an explanation for the dip um, on the 1st of November, which is the day after Halloween. True. That is yeah. true. I don't, I don't know what happened on the 15th of November, um, but um, at least the first, that could be in maybe an explanation why um, the pattern looks like that. Yeah, that, that is actually very true. And it is an 11 a.m. lecture, so it's not super early in the morning, but it is still the morning. So yeah, mm -hmm. you're right mm -hmm. that it could have been post Halloween. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll go on, but yeah, do feel free to interrupt if, if more questions are coming up. Um, so yeah, this is about the relationship between uh, attendance and, um, and accessing recordings. Um, and all we've done so far is just we plotted a graph looking at um, the percentage of students who accessed the different recordings. Um, but we stratified this by whether or not they've attended the lecture. So because we were able to um, merge our data set, so we were able to match students' attendance with their um, recording access, we were able to plot this graph. So as you can see, we've got the students who attended in the lighter dotted line at the bottom, and then we've got the students who didn't attend in the black line, black solid line, which tends to be above. And as you can see, the percentage of students who access the recordings is actually different according to whether or not they, access, uh, they attended the lecture. And in general, it seems to be that students who did attend the lecture um, are accessing the recording less and students who didn't attend the lecture, they are the ones who access it more. Um, and that I think makes sense on a lot of uh, levels. So in the qualitative data, which I will not really talk about, but I'll just mention here because I think it's quite interesting. A lot of students mentioned that the main use that they could see for lecture recordings was to make up for a lecture that they couldn't attend, either because they were ill or because they had other commitments that they um, had to attend to. Um, so I think what, what this graph is really reflective of is that um, opportunity to use lecture recordings as a, a makeup strategy for, for any lectures that were missed. And it seems that um, the, record, the use of recording for students who didn't attend lectures, um, it oscillates kind of between 30 and 60%, whereas for those who did attend, it seems to be around 20%. So there, there is a difference in usage between those two groups. I'm just going to... Uh, okay, I checked the chat again, but that was, that was a comment, not a question. Um, so I will now move on to talking about the questionnaire data. Uh, we had a questionnaire put together for our students um, in the first weeks of the semester. We made it available in the first weeks of the semester, but it was available until the end of the semester in early December. So the students were able to fill it out um, at whichever stage they, they found it useful. Um, and we had 263 students who filled out the questionnaire, which is quite a large majority in the course that had 327 signed up. 
so we are really quite happy that the majority of our students decided to fill out our questionnaire. And 206 of our participants also gave consent to link their questionnaire data to their performance and attendance data available through the university systems. So we were able to do the linking for 206 of participants. Um, and in the questionnaire, we asked our students for some um, to report um, some of their study behavior. Um, but because the questionnaire started quite early on in the semester, we didn't, we asked them to report retrospectively, but rather uh, we were often asking them about their intention. So we said, the course will have 30 lectures. How many of these lectures do you intend to attend? That, that would be an example of a question. Um, we also included some social psychological measures. Um, so we've got measures of attitudes and norms that I will talk about um, in a minute. And we also had a measure of identification, uh, which we haven't analyzed yet, but we are hoping to. Um, and then we also measured approaches to learning, so deep and surface learning. Um, and we also had some open questions about the use and the value of lecture recordings. Um, and again, I won't really touch upon that, but we have read some of those responses and we have some anecdotal evidence about how students are using or hoping to use lecture recordings and why or how they are useful for them. So I just wanted to uh, show you exactly what questions we asked when we asked students about their attitudes. Um, and we asked those questions about three different behaviors. So we asked quest uh, questions about students' attitudes towards attending live lectures in person. We asked them about attending lectures and then watching the recording. Um, so a supplement use. Um, and then we asked them about watching recordings instead of attending lectures in person. So a substitution use. Um, and for each of these three behaviors, we asked them um, semantic differential scales around their attitude. So we asked um, on a seven point scale whether attending lectures, for example, was bad or good, whether it was harmful or beneficial, unpleasant, pleasant, foolish, wise, and unnecessary, necessary. So these were uh, seven point Likert type scales which were anchored at these two adjectives that you can see. Um, and these item responses were highly intercorrelated and um, so what we did is we averaged them into a single score. Um, so a higher score on this measure would uh, represent a more positive attitude towards that particular behavior. The second set of questions that we gave our students uh, were designed to measure their perceived peer norm. So we wanted to know what the students thought that other students in their classroom were thinking. And again, we asked that about attending lectures, about using them as a supplement, and about using them as a substitute. Um, so just to read one out for you, uh, when we asked about the attendance norm, for instance, we would ask, how useful do you believe Psychology 1A students feel the live lectures are in this course? So this was all about our students' perception of what the norm was in the course among other students in the course. And then we also asked about another norm and that was the lecturer's view or the lecturer's um, feeling about using lectures or lecture recording in a particular way. Um, and here again, we asked that about attending lectures, about using them as a supplement and using them as a substitute. Um, and an example here would be how useful do you think your lectures in Psychology 1A consider the live lectures to be as a teaching tool? Um, so this is asking students about how useful, how useful their lecture thinks that a particular thing is, whether a lecture delivered live or lecture recording. So let's first look at the attitudes and the norms um, re regarding attending live lectures. Um, and I'm just going to present you some histogram uh, from the questionnaire study that we've done. Um, so here, these are histograms for their own attitude. And this is a, a composite score of those five questions that we had. And then the lecturer's norm in the middle and the student's peer norm on the right hand side. Uh, and the scores are at the bottom. So we are between one and seven, uh, seven being more positive, more positive attitude or more positive norm. 
And as you can say, there is certainly a skew. Um, so the attitude is really quite positive with the majority of students responding six or seven on the seven point scale. Uh, the norm of lectures is extremely skewed. So certainly most students think that their lectures would say that attending live lectures is very much useful. And then the student's norm, so the peer norm, again, is skewed with most students knowing or thinking that their peers think attending live lectures is useful. Um, and this is a little bit more varied than the lectures norm, but still very much a positive um, perceived norm here. So altogether, we've got a positive attitude towards attending live lectures. We've got a very clear positive norm from the lectures and the peer norm that is very much similar to own attitude. So let's move on to using lectures as lecture recordings as a supplement. So this is what we mean by this is attending the live lecture, but then using the recording to help either in revision or just in clarifying more difficult concepts or in completing the notes. And here we've got the histograms for this one. Um, they, uh, I've kept the scales constant, so the, the bars are somewhat shorter than we saw them in the attending lectures histograms. And as you can see here, again, we've got scores between one and seven, um, and there still seems to be a skew. So still the attitude and the norms are more positive than they are negative, but it seems to be somewhat less dramatic um, than we saw for attending live lectures. Um, so the attitude is positive, both for own attitude and for the norms, um, but it is a bit more evened out between the scores of five, six, and seven. And we don't have such a big peak for seven like we had in the lectures norm in the attendance question. So we've got positive attitudes and norms, but less decisive or less dramatic than we saw for live attendance. And then finally, we've got a set of results for substitution. Um, so this is when students would not go to the live lecture, but would watch the recording and treat that as a substitute. Um, and here again, we've got the histograms. I've just pasted uh, the questions again to, to make this easier to follow. Um, so as you can see, actually for the attitude, we've got almost a normal distribution. So it seems that most students have a neutral attitude towards using lectures as a substitute, um, and it is distributed evenly between the negative and the positive side of the scale. Um, for the lecture norm, we actually have a very even distribution here. So it seems that different students have a very different perception of whether or not lecturers would say um, that these um, lecture recordings are useful to be used as a substitute. And then if you look at the right-hand side histogram, the student norm, this is really quite interesting because what we can see here is a very positive attitude that's being attributed to other students. So even though students' own attitude seems to be neutral, and normally distributed, it seems that the perceived norm among other students is overwhelmingly positive and that students think that other students would say um, that watching recorded lectures rather than attending them online is very useful. So here, just to summarize these results, we've got a normal distribution of attitudes. So most students would say um, that they have a neutral attitude towards using lectures as a substitute. Sorry, I can just say that there is a typo here in the title. So it should be substitute rather than supplement. Um, we've got an even distribution for the lecture norm. So the students don't really seem to have a very strong opinion what their lecturers think about using lecture recordings as a substitute. Um, and there seems to be a very positive peer norm. So a positive attitude that's being attributed to other students about using lecture recordings as a substitute. Um, and this is something that in, in social psychology, we might refer to as pluralistic ignorance. So this is a, a phenomenon that we encounter, for example, in alcohol consumption on campus, uh, where students maybe don't have a very positive attitude towards binge drinking themselves, but they feel that it's very much okay and acceptable by other students. And that seems to have an effect on students' own alcohol consumption. So I'm wondering if 
maybe what's happening here is that students maybe themselves wouldn't necessarily say that using lecture recordings as a substitute is a good thing to do but because they feel that everyone else thinks that way it feels more permissible and more okay to do that um, so i find these data these particular three graphs really interesting and i think this is where we might go with our intervention so i think part of our intervention will be to try and communicate those norms more clearly so that students understand what the lecturer's norm is and also maybe understand that the attitude in the cohort is not quite as positive as they might think. So this will bring me to the third part, which will be about clustering. I'm just checking if anyone has any questions and I'm gonna have a sip of water. If there's any question, feel free to pop it in the in the chat window, or you can also um, say the question. Um, there's another question here. Um, do we know what lecturers actual attitudes are? Um, so, yes, we do. However, mostly anecdotally. <laughs> so we, we didn't actually ask the lecturers um, on this particular course to kind of formally voice their opinions, but we know um, that actually most lecturers that taught on this course were quite skeptical about lecture recording. Um, so most of them, I think if we showed them this graph, they would be quite puzzled, but this is something that, that we need to do and actually see what they think. Um, but I think that if you ask the lecturer, any lecturer who teaches on this course about their attitude towards using lecture recordings as a substitute, uh, I would say that their, their attitude would be quite negative. Oh yes, and Eva is saying that we can still ask the lecturers. So that, that is true, we can definitely gather the data. And um, there were five or six of them teaching on the course. So it's not a big number to ask. Okay, I don't see any more questions. So I'm just gonna move on to the next part, which is the shortest. Um, so I think we probably have another five minutes or so of the presentation and then we can open it up for discussion. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to show you is some very preliminary clustering. So this is some analysis that I've literally been doing about 10 minutes before uh, I came here on Zoom. Um, so it's very much not polished, but I wanted to share it with you uh, because really what we wanted to do was to replicate the kind of analysis that O'Brien and Verma did with their data. And we had similar variables to them. So we certainly had the attendance data, um, maybe not quite as reliable as theirs because they had a research assistant come in to lectures and actually mark whether or not people were attending, but we had our top hat data, so we thought it would be good to use that. Then we had data on lecture recording access, and actually this was very similar to O'Brien and Verma, so they also had ECHO 360, and they also used data on whether or not the particular lecture was accessed. Um, we also used our intention to attend lectures data, so this was a self-reported a variable that we had within the questionnaire. Um, and we also asked um, about students' intention to read the textbook. Um, we thought that, again, this might be an, an important study behavior and that it would be um, an interesting one to use in the clustering analysis. What we did not use, unlike O'Brien and Verma, was the data on downloading lecture notes. And as I said before, that is because we had a lot of variability in how lectures uploaded their slides. And also we didn't see very much variability in whether or not students actually downloaded those notes. So the impression we got from exploring the data was that every student downloaded the lecture notes um, and it just wouldn't really help with, with the clustering. Um, so when we did the cluster analysis, we found, just like O'Brien and Verma, we found four clusters of students, uh, but they were a little bit more difficult to name uh, with uh, well-fitting names. So I think O'Brien and Verma did a really good job 
in finding good names for, for their clusters, and I really struggled. Um, so our first cluster, I kind of named digital, because that's the cluster where we didn't see very high attendance, um, but we did see quite a lot of recording access. So um, on average, 41% of recordings were being accessed. There was a moderate intention to attend, um, 42%. So student, the average intention was to uh, attend 42% of lectures. Um, but the intention to read the textbook was relatively low. So we had a five point scale. And here this was on average 1.8. And um, then we had the second cluster. And here I really struggled to, um, to find out a good name. And maybe we should call them the well-intentioned because they had a very high intention to attend. So they said that they would attend 83% of lectures, but actually they attended about half. They didn't really use the recordings very much. So 32% of recordings were accessed and they had a moderate intention to read the textbook. So 2.6 on a five point scale on average. Um, then we had the third cluster and these were students who had moderate attendance, 40%, uh, fairly low recordings use, 32%, um, high intention to attend, but not as high as the previous cluster, so only 66%, and again, a moderate intention to read the textbook. So clusters two and three are quite similar. Uh, the main difference is in their attendance rate. So cluster two actually had higher attendance than cluster three. Um, and then we've got the fourth cluster, which I called traditional, um, kind of in uh, keeping with the O'Brien's and Verma terminology. Um, and these were students who actually attended most lectures, um, so 73% attendance, um, not very much recording use, about 24%. Um, they had a high intention to attend, 93%. Um, and their intention to read the textbook was again moderate, but the highest of the four clusters. So these are the students who really are, seem to be fairly highly engaged um, and they, they score high on most behaviors apart from the recording use, which was relatively low. So just to sum up um, the results that we've got so far, um, we had attendance rates of about 70%, and they decreased in the second half of the semester. Um, the recordings, access to recordings fluctuated between 20 and 40%, depending on the date. Um, but students who didn't attend the lecture, they were more likely to access the recording. Um, it seems that the norms, the perceived norm among students is quite unclear regarding what the lecturers think about the usefulness of using. Uh, lecture recordings, especially as a substitute. Um, and there are some clusters present in the data, but they are not quite as clear as in the O'Brien and Verma study. And that could be simply because we've got a lower sample size, but it could also be that we just don't have such clear clusters and that students behavior varies on different axes than we had in the clustering procedure. So this is something that we will certainly explore more and maybe we can um, try to gather a larger data set um, so we can get clearer clusters. We, we see what we can do about that. Um, so when it comes to ideas for intervention, I would be really keen to focus on the lecture norms since they seem to be so unclear, especially around um, using lecture recordings as a substitute. So I think communicating that more clearly and also explaining to students why using lecture recordings as a substitute is not the best idea, but also giving them advice on how to use lecture recordings effectively as a supplement. I think that would be a great focus for the intervention. Um, I think the intervention might also do something to address the pluralistic ignorance. So this feeling in among the students that everyone else thinks that using lecture recordings as a substitute is a good idea. I think we might be able to address that and to say that actually um, the attitude among students seems to be quite neutral um, and maybe we can also um, convince them that this is not a good use of lecture recordings. Um, and then we also didn't see a very high intention to use the textbook at all um, and I think again that is something that we might address in the intervention talking about the importance of uh, actually looking things up in the textbook and using that as a resource 
maybe to fill in some gaps in the notes or for revision um, before the exam or before um, the next blog. Um, so there, there seems to be some room for, for addressing that uh, within their intervention, especially if we take a holistic approach and take the students from, through the entire cycle from um, reading the textbook and preparing for the lecture all the way through the lecture itself and revision afterwards. Um, so that brings me to the end of the talk. I just wanted to um, thank you all for joining during these uh, unusual and, and uncertain times. Um, thank you very much for zooming in. And, and now I'd love to hear your thoughts, comments, and questions. And you can also email or tweet um, if you remember something afterwards. Thank you so much, Kasia. So I'm going to clap on behalf of everyone there. Thank you. Um, yes, I think we have maybe five minutes or so. If someone has a question, uh, just put them in the chat. Um, some people have just used the private chat to ask me and I ask um, the crowd or ask Kasia. Um, so I have one question here. Did you look at the relationship between type of student and grades? Uh, not yet is the answer. So we, we have the data and, and it's certainly on the list, but we just haven't had the time yet. Okay. Um, there's a question um, from Emily. Um, Emily, yeah, feel free to ask. Oh, hello. Hang on. I'm going to put my video on because it makes me feel less like we're in the apocalypse. Hi. Hello. Oh, my face looks really big. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, <laughs> so could you go back to the slide that has the four the four clusters. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. I know I agree. It's it's really really difficult to actually um to to think of uh the names for them. I'm just wondering if there's something about like you know how you're saying about like the good intentions. Like, is it something about like their ability to like a, I'm thinking of it from like a, a self regulation mm. perspective. Um, is it something about how like this one cluster that didn't really intend on going and they kind of follow through on their attempt, like their ability to regulate is, is better, even though like how often they're going and how often they're watching the recordings is about the same. Is it, is it that kind of failure to follow through on intentions that is the difference there? Like I, I'm wondering what data you have that you could maybe look at like in terms of percentage, which cluster has the biggest difference between their intentions and their behavior. Mm. Yeah, that's that's a good point. I think the the I can definitely look at those differences, and then in terms of the other data that I've got, maybe the approaches to learning might yeah give us something. I don't really have self-regulated learning in there, so no. Um, but I suppose even just like the if you look at the difference between attendance and intention to attend, mm -hmm. and then do you have intention to Intention to read the, I don't suppose you have any data on whether or not they actually read the textbook, do you? No. No, no. Okay. I will I will hopefully get some data on their use of lear, of the reading lists because that's okay. another thing that we've got. But then you know, some students might be just downloading the papers of Google Scholar and not yeah. going to the reading list. So I don't want to pay too much attention to that. Um, but you know, we, we do have more data, so we can then yeah. pick through other things, that's for sure. Yeah. Okay, that was me done. I'll, okay. I'll go away now. I'll Thank you. Face. No, that's fine. It's good. Thank you. Uh, we have a question. Um, Evan wants to ask a question, so feel free to just uh, unmute and ask. Hello. Hi, Evan. Hi, Evan. Uh, <laughs> how are you doing? Um, so I was wondering, do you think it will the perceptions will be the same in people that don't study psychology? Do you think it will be different between disciplines? Because I can see how psychologists might have a vague interest in memory and retention and would be potentially more have stronger opinions on it um, and I, I can't really remember the psychology one a course but I think did they not also have a section on a, 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 some classes on memory failure and no so memory like, doesn't come in until second semester okay, right, that's, uh, that's which good. yeah I think in a way that's good <laughs> yeah <laughs> because they they didn't get that information and actually the lecturer who teaches memory is very much against lecture recording right. yes. uh, so he doesn't okay. record his lectures which is another interesting uh, combination there and um, so yeah I'm not I'm not entirely sure how this would be in other disciplines I think 
you know, I think our attendance at lectures, when I spoke to my, my colleagues in other departments, our attendance is quite similar. I don't know if our recordings use is similar, but, um, but that's something that hopefully we'll be able to compare once we've got data from other departments. Yeah, I, I think in terms of perceptions of lecture capture, it might mm. vary a bit. Yeah, I mean, you know, overwhelmingly, they, they were really positive in psychology um, and more in the qualitative data that I've only kind of eyeballed. And um, a lot of students were talking about uh, using them as a supplement. Um, I don't know if that's because of social desirability, because they thought that that was the okay thing to say, or if that was really what they were intending to do. Um, but again, hopefully when we have more granular data, we'll be able to say what, what students actually have been doing. Excellent, thanks. Thank you. So we have a comment by Ken Mavor. Um, he said, regarding clustering, um, these seem more of a linear set from low to high rather than qualitatively different. We don't have a disengaged cluster. That, that is true. So I'm just uh, looking, oops, looking at my clusters again here. Um, that, that's true. So everyone, everyone is doing something. Um, yeah, hello, so, Ken. Yeah. <laughs> Hi, Ken. So my, my thought, because it was just like, it, it really looks like you've just got like two linear trends here, right? From mm. low attendance to high attendance and from high record, you know, moderate recording use to, to low recording use. Because, because I think yeah, in that other study, they have that disengaged cluster. So mm. it, really, it really gives you a sense of a qualitative uh, difference from the others. I can't remember what the, what the, what their, what their third one, or their fourth one, if, if you take out the disengaged and the digital and the traditional, I can't remember what their fourth one was. But I was, think it was minimal. They were only downloading the notes. If it was just in the middle, then I think really, in a sense, what they've got is is a similar thing to you, which is just really a high, medium, and low. Mm. But they've got what they've got is a kind of a, a totally disengaged group, which you don't seem to have here, which is which is you know good in this case, right? <laughs> yeah, yep. people who are totally disengaged, um, uh, who are who are low on everything, but so so it may be that the clustering is not really. Um, helping in the in the sense of of being able to distinguish clearly distinctive qualitative groupings mm -hmm. but rather just reflecting the you know it's, it's just kind of in a sense capturing those 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 chunks going from low to high etc so in, in a way that simplifies your analysis a little bit in that case <laughs> that's true no and, and i think you're right that when i was doing this clustering i i paid attention to the different means and really what's driving the difference is attendance everything else seems to be virtually the same and uh, definitely the textbook and the recording use they are very close maybe the intention to attend so i think that that suggestion by emily i'll definitely follow up on it if it could be that ability to follow up on intention that's kind of contributing here as well. Yeah, well, actually, I was, I, was, I was looking at that uh, when Emily raised that. And but actually, the difference between the attendance and the intention to attend is pretty similar mm. across, across all the, I mean, um, you, know, you know, it's more or less a similar kind of amount. So, so it may be that, in fact, there's just a generic, um, of course, difference between intention and actual behavior. Um, but that doesn't seem to be kind of, as far as like, you know, eyeballing it, that doesn't seem to sort of be an interactive, you know, interaction type issue there as well. So it, it may be that it's similarly, it's just a parallel line. True, true. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll know more once I've done more churning. Yeah. But, but, you know, I mean, the, the you know, it, it, it just shows very clearly that, that, um, that general you know, negative relationship, of course, between attending and, and lecture recording use. Uh, whereas, you know, if, if, you're, if you are thinking that, um, you know, that kind of, that, that other assumption that people make about the fact that people would come to lectures, but then still use lecture recording as, as uh, additional, that, that supplementation, right? That's kind of not showing up, right? So that's the, I guess that's that's the real difference in your data that people aren't doing it that way, uh, and I think that's consistent with some of the literature, right? That that in fact that's quite a small the, the number of people who do that is quite small, 
even though it's a justification that's often used. People say that's what they're going to do, <laughs> but they don't actually do it, uh, is what I seem to recall from hmm. that. Well, that's interesting because I don't think I know that literature, so I'm going to have to go back and, and try to find that. Um, because, yeah, I think a lot of people talk about the relationship, but, but I didn't know that they actually talked about that supplementation not being done that often. Yeah, I think so. I mean, yeah, okay. uh, yeah, I, I can't remember specific papers, but I think there was a, I remember reading at one point, yeah, that idea that that people would um, attend and then also use the lecture recording uh, at a higher rate as well. Mm -hmm. um, but that that tends to not happen. And, and also, as, as it appears in your data, that's not what's going on. So the, those that think that to um, use that as a, a strategy, that tends to be not what's going on here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that, that's definitely the pattern that, that we have. Um, thank you, Ken. Um, yes. I have a question here um, from Jonathan Firth. Um, he mm -hmm. put it in the chat. Um, intention to read textbook and actual recording use look like they may negatively correlate. Um, I wonder if this relates to students' flawed conceptions of themselves as learners. Um, it's kind of this works for me rather than seeing a combination of activities as useful. Jonathan, feel free to come in um, with your video um, if you want to clarify something. Um, Or Katya can just answer the question. <laughs> yeah, so I think, um, I don't think I can really comment on the correlation. Because You're in space, oh, Jonathan. You're oh, yeah. in space. In weird oh. <laughs> I can't see. Oh, here you are. Hello. There we go. I'm in normal background now. Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. <laughs> my, my spare room is now my office. <laughs> Fun times. So did, did, you, did you want to ask the question uh, again or should I comment? Yeah, I think again? Carolina uh, summarized it perfectly. Yeah, just this idea that maybe your cluster one people here, um, maybe they don't think that reading a textbook is like a good strategy for them. They think a, a video is maybe, you know, how, like maybe mm. their, their learning style or whatever. They, they perhaps don't appreciate the, the combination. I just wonder in terms of like educating students about how to learn effectively if it kind of could could link into that um you know realizing that actually using a mixture of these strategies would be useful thanks very much for the talk by the way thank you and and thank you for the question so yeah i think um i don't know so i haven't actually looked at the correlation between this intention and anything else so all we've got here is just the averages that we see in the clusters and i think you know the the main thing i'm seeing here is that the, the students who are the most engaged, so the ones who attend the lectures and the one who, ones who have the intention to attend, they are the ones who also read the textbook, whereas it's the ones who rely on the recordings a lot, who don't read it or don't even have the intention to read the textbook. Um, so I don't know, I was kind of thinking about it in, in the context of overall engagement you know are they doing things that we are telling them to do or are they not um but yeah i i totally agree with you that we need to teach them how to learn effectively because i think we don't um and i think you know we we tell them about the textbook but we don't necessarily guide them through how to use it um and at no point within this course are they tested on whether or not they've done the reading? So it's a recommended reading, but it never gets tested or reinforced in any way. So I think they probably don't even open the textbook up until towards the exam. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I suppose having something like maybe, a, I don't know, um, uh, is it something that some colleagues would do to have a like a like a quiz at the beginning on like the reading from last week or something um i'm not entirely sure if anyone is doing that um consistently so i think some colleagues would do it every now and then but it would probably be mostly about the lecture content from last week uh, rather than uh, the textbook but it's yeah. definitely something that once we've got the intervention i think it is something that we could incorporate um, so as, as a way of motivating students to actually do a bit of reading, we could introduce a quiz within the lecture. 
Okay, thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you, Jonathan. Um, we have Emily who is raising her hand for quite a while now. So um, yeah, you are up next with your question. And please tell us how you raise your hand because I'm trying to find the function and I don't <laughs> know how. <laughs> um, if you click on the participants view, um, there should be a bunch of options. So you can say like raise hand or yes, no, and go slower and, and stuff. So. All right, okay. Um, oh, I can't remember. <sighs> What was I going to say? Oh, I think this has already kind of been discussed, but you know, when you're saying about like, we need to teach them how to, to learn and stuff. I think the issue of the supplemental use comes in the same thing as well, because I think with lecture recordings, it's very much like the focus is on like, use them as a catch up. Um, use them to, you know, like if you miss the lecture or like, there's all these kind of reasons that, you know, we give them. And I don't actually think we may be like, I don't think we tell them how to use the recordings week by week. Like, mm -hmm. We talk about them as a revision tool, but I don't think we actually talk to them very often about like, oh, you know, each week when you're doing your notes, you should go back and watch the recording and that really explicit way of like, concretely, how would you actually do this? Um, and I think um, you're right, uh, is it Ken? Um, about saying that the supplemental use is probably quite low um but i yeah i i think that's potentially our fault rather than than their fault um yeah so. yeah i mean you know i i couldn't agree more and i think that's why we are thinking about this intervention to yeah. really guide them through the entire process because i think we make a lot of assumptions about what what they know or what they can already do um, but especially with the lecture recordings, we, uh, I think, you know, Glasgow has maybe been better, but at Edinburgh, there has been hardly any guidance. Um, and I think only this year with your guidance that has been printed out and given to mm. students, but I don't think many of them actually process that. Um, yeah, because I mean, so Glasgow is going opt out. The mm -hmm. policy isn't through yet, but that's, I mean, that, God knows whether it's going to happen now, but with everything. Um, yes, but, but the plan is for it to go opt out. So it'll be interesting to see whether or not having that guidance in place from the beginning and, and having, so we've got this course that we made off the basis of the, 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 the recommendations, which is making the most of lectures. Mm -hmm. And it's a Moodle course that it should take them maybe one to two hours to work through. And they mm -hmm. can do it in their own time, but it tells them things like time management and how to take notes uh, and how to include lecture recordings in their weekly uh, schedule. So they've, mm -hmm. we've been piloting that for the last couple of months, but the idea is that that will be pushed to every first year as part of their induction. Mm -hmm. So hopefully if we can instill it there, I think one of the problems is that once they get to second year, they they're in their habit mm -hmm. and it's incredibly difficult to, to change that. Yeah, especially if it succeeded. <laughs> well, yeah, if they got some positive yeah. reinforcement on, yeah. Yeah, on that, what they were doing worked. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, you know, the, the idea that we have for the intervention is, is quite similar to the course that you've developed. I think mm. that the main difference will be that it will be more specific because it will be around one lecture and will actually guide them through the content. Yeah. As opposed to the, the kind of more general guidance. Yeah, I, I think I think that the norm thing as well is, is a really, really good idea. I think it's mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm really looking forward mm. to to finding out what's going on there because I'm yeah. puzzled. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Emily. Um, any other questions from the audience? There is a comment from Ken about the norms, but yeah, oh, okay. I think. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so obviously we can we can follow this up, but uh, and and you don't have this data yet, but uh, it'd be very interesting when you look at the identification data just to see, um, yeah, if it's the if it's the highly identified people who are, uh, in a sense, drawing more upon those um, those peer norms. Sorry, I've got printing going in the background here. Anyway, yeah, so so I'll be interested to chat to you once you've done those. Uh, done those analyses uh, and also the, the learning approach stuff, right? Because mm. I think that'll be, I think that'll be very interesting to see how that um, uh, plays into it as well. Um, Absolutely. You know, whether yeah. they see whether, you know, to what extent they actually are seeing uh, 
their activity, their use of the lecture recordings as uh, you know, what kind of what kind of learning in a sense they behaviorally are considering that whether that's a kind of surface learning behavior or whether whether they think of that as a deep learning behavior. Mm, um, that that's a good point. Yeah, yeah. we. I mean, we, we asked some qualitative questions, but I think I, I wish we asked more. So uh, I think in the follow up after the intervention, we'll, we'll definitely ask a few more. And yeah, we, we will ask something around that, whether it's, it's deeper surface. I think, I mean, I like, um, you know, Emily's work uh, and, and the point she's making just then about, uh, in a sense, using, using the guide, you know, in terms of guiding students, in terms of the usage of it, because in fact, if we were to if we were to think of it from a proactive point of view as opposed to a sort of passive use of like as as lecturers rather you know if we were to say how would we want students to use them as opposed to what can we do given that the institution is forcing us to do this um mm. we, we would want them to use it for review right if if there's anything uh you know that we would want educationally for them to do with it it would be it would be to help them with review mm. um and and so actually going back um after a period of time and re-engaging with the lecture um you know would we would see that as probably good educationally right to leave a mm -hmm. bit of a break and then go back and review and all that kind of stuff so we would see that probably as a actually, actually as a deep learning activity really mm -hmm. for them to revisit that material um and and so that is something that you know we can that you know in terms of your intervention i think um not only establishing the norms as a as an average level i guess but actually establishing those more subtle norms in terms of um, not just whether you should use it to, to replace lecture attendance, but actually you really should go back and rewatch this lecture in two weeks mm -hmm. time when you've had time to kind of digest and go back and you'll, you'll see what you missed, just like going back to a, a good movie or whatever, you'll see more the second time through, um, you know, so, so establishing those norms, those more those deep learning use of the, of the things, I think it'd be interesting part of the sort of normative intervention. Mm, yeah, that, that's a really good point. And I think maybe another open question in the making to say, you know, once students have gone through the intervention, what, what have they retained and what is the, the norm or, or the usage standards that we've, we've managed to implement? I, yeah. I think that that would be good. Thank you. Uh, we have another question. Um, David is asking, have you looked at how study behaviors, um, how, sorry, have you looked at other study behaviors like abandoning lecture capture to watch a few three minute YouTube videos instead? No, so we, we haven't asked about that. Um, and I guess that, that's another question that we maybe could ask in an open way. Um, and we certainly can't get that from the administrative data. So all we have is this pretty crude, how many times did they access and how much have they viewed? Um, but we have nothing on whether this was in small chunks or in big chunks and nothing on whether students took breaks to do something different and what that something different was. So, um, so unfortunately, no. Okay. Um, any other questions from the audience? If that's not the case, um, I just want to add that I think this data is incredibly interesting. Um, not, not, not only every single project has interesting data, but moving forward, it actually is a very good basis for intervention. So what you actually intended to do. And uh, that's fantastic because most of the, there was partly things that, um, people would claim, but we wouldn't have the, necessarily the data to, um, to support that. But with your project, we, we hopefully, once this is published, we have the data to support these kind of claims. But in addition to that, um, they can really be used uh, for interventions um, in, in the classroom. So it's, it's really nice. Thank you so much, Cassie, for this. And for yeah, presenting. thank you. It's, it's an ongoing challenge because I've never worked with this much data before. <laughs> but here we go. Hopefully, hopefully <laughs> it will be worth it. And, and yeah, we'll be able to share some insights that will inform uh, people's behavior and, and policy. So that, that would be great.
No, that's fantastic. Again, what we will do, we will uh, write a blog post, uh, uh, reflection blog post on the talk. Um, the recording will be uploaded and your slides as well so that people can engage with this um, later on. So thank you so much. And, Great. Uh, keep thank safe. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Yes. Keep safe, everyone.